Well, good morning and welcome to St. Mungo's Church Online. And if you're a guest with us, we hope you can be blessed by your time with us. My name's Ollie Clegg and I'm the Associate Rector here at St. Mungo's. In a minute, we are going to be going over to Mighty Mungo's, our family-focused time, where Dave and the Lions crew will be teaching us more about what it means to follow Jesus. And I'm excited about that. That will last for about 20 minutes, and then there's going to be a short break where you can refill your coffee cup and get ready for our adult-focused time, where as adults we worship together, uh, we look at the Word, and we receive more from God. I'm excited about this morning. I don't know about you. So I'm going to get ready for, for the Mighty Mungo's Mighty Minute. Yes, I've got another costume ready for you. This is my reindeer costume. So here we go. Let's get ready for some Mungo's Mighty Minute. We're going to start as we always do with the Mighty Minute. Are you ready? <laughs> what cartoons do fruits watch? Tom and Cherry! <laughs> Have you heard the story of the magic tractor? No. It turned into a field. <laughs> Who made King Arthur's Round Table? I don't know. Who made King Arthur's Round Table? Circumference. <laughs> Why did the Queen go to the dentist? I don't know. Why did the Queen go to the dentist? To get her teeth crowned. <laughs> What imperial vehicle destroys celebrities? I don't know. A star destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> Why did the children eat their homework? I don't know. Because their teacher said it was a piece of cake. <laughs> If you do, film it landscape and send it to mightymungos at stmungos.org and maybe next time we'll see you on Joke of the Week. Here at Mighty Mungos, we want to be known as a people who are thankful, who know what it is to be loved by God so much that it just overflows in thankfulness from our lives. And that's why we have a section called Gratitude Attitude, where you send in your videos of the things that you're thankful for in your life. Let's see who's on Gratitude Attitude this week. Roll the tape. I'm thankful for spotting my pet ladybug. I'm thankful for the trampoline and the climbing frame 
and the paddling pool. I am thankful for my family and my school. I'm thankful for kittens. Meow. I am thankful for Nerf guns and Lego. Thankful for berry picking. I am thankful for my friends and then back to nursery. I'm thankful for spaghetti. I'm thankful for friends. So, what are you thankful for? Send in your videos to Mighty Mungo. We love seeing your faces. It's time for WhatsApp. <laughs>
Hey Jarvis, you there? At your service, sir. Engage heads up display. Check. Who's our hero of the faith going to be today? Searching heroes of faith database. Here is John. Okay, get it loaded up. You're online and ready. So today we're going to start our new series where we look at some of the heroes of faith from in the Bible. We're going to look at their lives and then see how can we apply some of the things that they learn in our own lives today. If you're an adult or a teenager and you're watching this morning, we're going to be basing this series on a book called Lifelines by Mike Pilavacci and Andy Croft. I really recommend that you go out and grab yourself a copy. It'll just allow you to dig a little bit deeper as you go through the weeks. But let's start off. Who is your favourite superhero? Who's the one where you look at them and you go, oh, I really wish that I had that superpower. Or wouldn't it be awesome if I could shoot lasers from my eyes or whatever it might be? As you might have gathered from that little intro that we've just had, I love Iron Man. I'd love to have my own Iron Man suit with built-in Jarvis. It'd be absolutely epic! And actually, we're going to start today with our first superhero of faith, uh, who's actually got a pretty good name going on already. Him and his brother together were known as the Sons of Thunder. Uh, but you'll probably know him much better as John. He was a disciple of Jesus, and he also wrote a number of books in the New Testament, including the Gospel of John. Jesus changes people. It's said so often that it can feel a little bit like it's a bit of a cliche. But you know why it's said so much? It's because it's true. I heard of one guy who grew up in a Christian home, but decided when he went off to university that he was going to uh, try and do things on his own. He was going to try and make his own decisions. Uh, and actually what happened was he became pretty competitive, pretty selfish, pretty angry uh, and not a particularly nice person to be around. He pushed all of his family away. Uh, he shut down any conversation with any Christian friends that he might have who were trying to kind of help him. He'd push them to one side. Uh, and, and actually what happened was he became quite lonely. Uh, he became quite uh, distant from people uh, and his life hadn't actually really turned out the way that he thought it might. Then I heard that what happened was one, t one day he kind of saw in a few people that there was something different about them, that they had this kind of happiness, this kind of joy that, that he just knew he didn't have and he knew that he, he wouldn't have that if he continued living his life as he was. And so he set about just finding a little bit more about who Jesus was and what does it mean to be loved by Jesus. Gradually, he found that significance wasn't found in relationships, in work, in achievements, but was actually found in being loved to life by a God who sees all our flaws, all our failures, all of the things that uh, the thoughts that go on in his head. Uh, and yet chooses to still love him and chooses to still call him his beloved son. And you might be wondering, yeah, that's fine, Dave, but how do I know that story is true? Well, I know it's true because it's my story. That's me. I'm the one who's gradually learning what it means to be loved by God, what it means for God that, that created the whole universe, who sees all of my flaws, all of my failures, yet still chooses to love me and still chooses to call me his beloved son. It's quite an amazing transformation. It's quite an amazing thing that that does to the way that you see yourself and that you see the world around you. But let's just look at three examples uh, from John's life, which kind of highlight what he was like. So the first thing uh, is found in Mark. Jesus explains in quite grisly detail that he's going to be flogged, he's going to be spat on, he's going to be mocked and beaten, and he's going to be murdered in the most horrendous way. And John's reaction to that is to say, hey, Jesus, um, see, when you do die and you go to heaven, can I have that seat that's next to you? He doesn't even acknowledge what Jesus has got to go through. All he's thinking about is himself and what he is going to get from this. John was actually someone who was very selfish. In Luke, we read about how John was vengefully violent. He goes to a town to see whether Jesus can come uh, and do some teaching and do some ministry there. And the people of that town said, no, we don't want you to come, thank you very much. John comes back and he says, I can't believe it, Jesus. This is outrageous. They won't let us go. They won't let us teach there. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray to God and I'm gonna ask him to send down fire from heaven and completely destroy that village. I can't believe that they won't let us go. 
Sounds a little excessive, right? The last thing is that at the end of John's Gospel, uh, we read that Mary goes to the tomb and she sees that it's empty. So she runs off to find and tell the others. She comes across Peter and the other disciple, which is John, uh, and she tells them and they run to go and see what's been going on. And in John's description of this, he says that the other disciple, that's him, outran Peter. At the end of the book of John, uh, he writes that he doesn't have enough space to be able to write down all the amazing things that Jesus did. So he's just going to have to leave them out. But what is interesting is that he has found space to fit in there that he is a faster runner than Peter. It just shows that excessive competitiveness that John has got. So we can see that John is flawed, but he's actually also transformed. Right throughout his book, he often refers to himself as the beloved disciple or the disciple who Jesus loved. Now, after reading what I've just told you, you might think, well, that's just his arrogance. It's just his selfishness, making sure that everyone knows that he thinks that Jesus thinks that he's the best one. But I think it's something different going on here. I think actually John has realised and understood what it means to be loved by Jesus. I mean, properly love like deep down right in his guts to know that he is beloved of Jesus it's quite amazing it's quite a statement what would it be like for you and I to be able to really know deep down right in the depths of our being that we are God's beloved I think it would change everything Heavenly Father I pray that you would come now and you would pour in your love into our hearts that you would help us to understand what it means to be loved by you right down deep in our guts, that we would know what it is to be loved by you, that we would know how deep, how wide and how boundless is the love of God and that we'd experience that love this week. Amen. Mighty Mungos, every week we'd love to set you a memory verse challenge. We'd love for you to learn little bits of scripture, little bits of truth that you can then go and build your life upon. So let's see who sent in their memory verse challenge for this week. I will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit who will help you and always be with you. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit. It will always help you and always be with you. John 14 verse 16. I will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit who will help you and always be with you. I will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit who will help you and always be with you. John 14 verse 16. And now it's time for you to find out this week's memory verse challenge, which is... The Father has loved us so much. This shows how much he loved us. We are called children of God. So do send in your memory verse challenge videos to MightyMungos at setmungos.org. We can't wait to see more of your faces. Our time together is almost over, but we just have time for family face-off. It's now time for you to pop to the loo, grab some snacks, get a drink, 
Join us back here at 10.30 for the next part of our service this morning. We're going to have some worship. We're going to have a relevant talk from the Bible and we're going to be able to pray together. It's going to be amazing. We can't wait to share it with you. Join us back here at 10.30.
Well, welcome to St. Mungo's Church Online. And if you're just joining us now, we uh, hope you're going to encounter God this morning, especially if you're a guest. But it's great to be together. It was great to see some of the, the, the selfies that appeared on screen before. And again, thank you to all the team and the Lions family for our mighty Mungo's. In a minute, we are going to be going over uh, to sing our first hymn, and uh, it's going to be Immortal Invisible that Francis is going to lead us in, and I'm looking forward to that. Live prayer is available throughout the service, and if you're on our church online uh, platform, then you just have to press the, the live prayer, and then you can receive that at any point through the service. If you're on YouTube, you'll have to use another mobile device to do that. But well, let's uh, prepare our hearts and continue our worship by singing our first hymn. continue our worship from our week by saying our morning liturgy together. And some of the liturgy that we're going to say later on in our canticle is from Revelation 4 and 5. Uh, if you're a guest with us and you haven't done this before, liturgy, uh, saying our morning liturgy is just a great way of remembering who God is and helping us to focus on not just who God is, but what he's done for us. And there are parts which have all are underlined, which we say together. So uh, let's say our morning liturgy together. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Give us the joy of your saving help and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word and to seek forgiveness of our sins, that we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let's turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. So let's say this prayer together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. 
Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, I want to encourage you, if you're not already standing, you're very able to stand at this moment as we prepare to enter uh, uh, a continued uh, longer time of worship. So let's say this together. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise God. Let's say this together. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they have their being. You are worthy, O Lord Lamb, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign with you on earth. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honour and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's none like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God Our God Turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you There's none like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you There's none You are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God, our God Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other Our God is healer Awesome in power Our God, our God
is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God, our God. You so great God.
salvation in your name. salve 
Well, thanks again to the worship team for leading us into the presence of God. My name's Arlie Clegg. I'm the Associate Rector here at St. Mungo's. Now, one of the things that I have really been enjoying is seeing your faces on what we call the selfie section at, at the start of the service in between uh, Mighty Mungo's and our adult service. I'd really encourage you to send these in. This is an opportunity for us to see each other and see what we're up to. Maybe some of you have been away on holiday uh, and doing new things. So why don't you send your photos in? The email is gonna come up now uh, on the screen and please do send those uh, in to uh, some mangoes and we'll put them up. Uh, it's just a great way of, of seeing each other when we can't physically see uh, everyone in the church. So please do send those in. Now, uh, after the service today, we will be having uh, the opportunity for you to receive prayer ministry on Zoom. You know, one of the things that I've really been missing uh, in lockdown is the opportunity to pray for people, to, to put a hand on someone's shoulder and to, to pray for them, to ask the Holy Spirit to come. And so we have got an opportunity after service You'll have had an email through Church Suite, and if you haven't, it's probably in your junk uh, mail folder, but please, there's the Zoom code there, and please come on. We've got a team who are, are raring to pray for you, to hear from God and, and give you a picture or a word or a scripture that's gonna encourage you uh, today and for the rest of the week. So why not, if you haven't been on before, why not do that today? Now, one of the things I've also missed about our times is our is our ministry times. And so I want us just uh, uh, to spend a bit of time this morning just stilling our hearts and preparing our minds and our hearts to worship God as we listen to the word that Malcolm's gonna bring us from Philippians. So I wanna just imagine you just quieten your hearts right now and allow God to take you deeper into his presence. And I'm gonna read a scripture from Psalm uh, 16 that just helps us to think about the God who wants to encounter us this morning. You make known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures your right hand, at your right hand. Holy Spirit, we ask you just to come and to take us deeper into your presence that we may start to sense your presence right now. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit and fill us afresh. Come Holy Spirit. And just as we're starting to maybe go deeper into the presence of God, let's just thank God for some of the things that he's been doing for us this week. I wanna thank God that he's my rock and my refuge, that he's my sustainer this week. Why don't you just start thanking God for some of the things that he's done for you? And let's now just move into praising God for who he is, that he is our rock and our refuge, that he is our salvation, that he is Abba Father, that he is our saviour. In fact, he's the living father, the, the holy father, the righteous father. Just start praising God for who he is. And just as the Psalm says, we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Your word says, Father, that we can come into your, your courts, into your very throne room at any point to find help. And so we ask you, by your spirit, to give us a tangible sense of your presence right now. Whether that's through feeling the weight of your glory on our hands or the peace that uh, protects our hearts and minds just to fall on us or your love or maybe even your joy because in your presence is fullness of joy. But come, Father, by your spirit, Allow us to sense your presence.
I just want to encourage you, if there's anything that you're still feeling a little anxious about, why don't you give that to God? Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. So the peace of God might come and guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So if there's anything that you're just feeling a wee bit anxious about, just cast that onto the Lord for he cares for you. Why don't we just do that now? Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you that you care for us. And we just want to not just hear your word, but put it into practice this morning. We thank you for your word last week where we are called to rejoice, rejoice in you. And Lord, we want to rejoice in you by hearing your word and put it into practice. So would you give us a heart and mind to, to understand and, and a spirit to sustain us. Holy Spirit, come and give us a hunger to put into practice to what you call us to do today, to live for Jesus and be who you've called us to be, the light of the world. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I have a real problem when it comes to anything to do with finances. I don't understand spreadsheets. I don't understand balance sheets. I don't understand my financial advisor. I'm so bad at it that when Catherine, our church finance director and treasurer, comes and prepares <coughs> material that she, she gives to the uh, vestry so we understand our financial situation, I don't understand her updates. So what she does just for me, she will put a little picture there, a, a smiley type face. There'll be the first one, uh, that's the one we want to see, where it's a smiley face. Sometimes we have a straight face and sometimes we have a sad face. That's the only way she can get me to understand finances. Now, the problem today is that the passage we're going to look at in the Bible is actually full, deliberately full of financial terms and financial ideas. So I'm going to do the very best that I can to handle this as I explain to you uh, what the Apostle Paul is teaching. We're really picking up from where we were last, uh, last week. This is part two of this talk, so I'm going to pick up the, from the scriptures. I'm going to pick up at Philippians chapter 3 and read through uh, verses 3 to 11. For we are the circumcision, who worship by the Spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, as to the uh, uh, people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that I by any means possible, I may obtain the resurrection of the dead." This passage is deliberately full of words that you'll find on the front page of a Financial Times or in an account, so in an audit. That word account does mean evaluate, access, assess, audit. And there are two other main words that we find in there. It's that word confidence. And in this passage, it's particularly about confidence. What makes you confident that you can enter into the presence of God? And the other key word is righteousness, literally being right with God. How can we be right with God? Basically, what are we putting our confidence in about being right with God? And that's the most important question you can ask yourself. When you stand before God, what right have you to enter eternal life? Why should God let you into his heaven? Because the answer you give will not only affect your eternal destiny, but also how you live now, how you make decisions 
the way you focus. So what are you putting your confidence in? The Apostle Paul is giving us a little bit more of his biography, his autobiography. He starts by uh, telling us what his confidence is, and it's, it's like a column, it's like his prophet column. And he literally is ticking them off on his fingers. He said, I have, I have four uh, categories I possess by involuntary hereditary. I have three categories I possess by my choice and conviction. So, for instance, he says, I have ecclesiastical advantage circumcision. I have national advantage, people of Israel. I have ancestral advantage, tribe of Benjamin. I have family and parental advantage, Hebrew of Hebrews, to which he adds then things that he's chosen to do, his attitudes, his achievements. He excelled at everything he turned himself to. He said, I'm a Pharisee. Now, for most of us, Pharisees means hypocrite, but in those days it didn't. A Pharisee was actually the spiritual elite. They were the spiritual athletes. Ath um, athletes they were the most passionate for God and zeal he said I was incredibly zealous now of course his zeal was focused in the wrong way but he was passionately and zealously wrong and then ethically he lived a righteous life morally blameless morally faultless holy what a life so if you asked him uh, before before he became a Christian how did you put, how would you get right with God? He'd give you this prophet column. But as Paul discovered, it was not the bad things that kept Paul away from God, but the good things. He had to lose his religion to find his salvation. Now, what a list of good things. He never compromised. He was zealous. He was passionate. He lived a wholehearted, faultless, holy life. But, but, we come to a but in the Bible. It's verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. The great reversal be begins this, uh, what is one, basically one long sentence, uh, this whole paragraph is. It's a theologically rich sentence. And he says, one day on the road to Damascus, God did an audit on Paul and it blew him apart. The book, the finance book was carefully opened, audited by the heavenly accountant and the result was staggering. I think at this point, the Apostle Paul is looking back on his conversion, the day, the hour, the minute <coughs> when his whole personal spiritual accountancy system broke down. All that accumulated profit of years slumped to rock bottom. Nothing. Black Monday. The shares tumbled. Financial crisis. Christ entered the calculation and Paul discovered actually he had had a false accountancy system. He, like many good people today, thought that he was righteous by his good works and his spirituality. But he was wrong. Sincerely wrong, but wrong. Now, some of the things I'm going to say might sound harsh because we're in a world full of sincere people who genuinely think that they are nice, that they do good things to help others, that they're spiritual, that they pray, they care. And they think that that will get them right with God. They sincerely believe in what they say and do, but they are sincerely wrong. Not because I say so, but because God in Christ has revealed it so. This is the fundamental teaching in the Bible, which makes actually Christianity absolutely a unique faith. And what it means about becoming a Christian. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. It's all Christ focus. The long list of good things he saw as profit suddenly gets shifted in the audit for, to the loss column. It's into the red. Not just zero, it's a liability, it's negative equity. He had carefully laid out all his confidence and he had to then put them into a bag marked loss. He discovered he was desperately spiritually bankrupt. He cannot get to heaven. They were, there was a, they were the problem, not the solution. Paul has taken advantages all on his credit side and then item by item, forgetting nothing, omitting nothing, excluding nothing, he dumps them into the column marked loss, bad debt. You see, that's what Jesus taught. Mark 8, verse 36, Jesus says, What profit is it for you to gain the whole world but forfeit your soul? Now, instead of the long list, he just has one thing, Christ. On the credit side is Christ alone and nothing else. Because on the cross, Christ covered the debt. He paid the price for our sin. He paid it on the nail. And he opened the way to heaven, to receiving God's righteousness and his forgiveness. 
In verse 3, Paul is looking back at the point when he realized he wasn't right with God, despite all the things that he thought helped. So what is your story? When did you discover it is all about Christ and his gift of love? While it's not so dramatic, I had to come to that realization. As a teenager, I, of course, would assume that I was a Christian, because I'd been told so by the church and by society. I was a cultural Christian. I was a neat, tidy, hard-working grammar school boy. I'd been christened as a baby, confirmed early by the Bishop of Guildford at 12. I went to the 8 a.m. early morning communion on Sundays. I was Church of England. I was English, and therefore, by my definition, a Christian. My works clearly got me on God's side. I sincerely believe that. I was oblivious and ignorant that this wasn't enough until I met real Christians. They were meeting on a, in a grotty room on a Monday evening, and many of those were long-haired, ex-drug addicts, the alienated, Jesus freaks. They were led by a tough, wiry Scot from the slums of Edinburgh, the kind of person a nice Surrey boy like me shouldn't have gone near. But they really believed that they, they had a real relationship with Christ. They were totally in love, which is they knew Jesus personally. They were passionate about him. They'd done nothing to uh, earn God's love, but discovered that was fine because it was all a free gift. All my religion, all my churchianity had done was blind me to my need of Jesus Christ. I had to dump it all to become a real Christian. Now let's move on and look at verse 8. So it gets exciting. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This is the key to the whole passage. This is the, the, the whole basis. This is what hope is based on. And you know how in Mighty Mungos, the children have a memory verse. Well, this is your memory verse for this week. Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This is Paul's vision. And it's a vision that we need again right at the center of our church life. Professor Gordon Fee in his brilliant commentary says, and a return to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord would go a long way towards renewing the church's task in the modern world. You see, this is explosive culture changing truth. Note here that while the Apostle Paul regularly uses the full title of the Lord Jesus Christ, only here does he turn it around and personalize it. He reverses it. He says, he talks about knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's about knowing Christ Jesus, but look at the personal, my Lord. See, salvation is always personal. Can you say, Jesus Christ is my Lord? It appears that in verse 7, Paul is looking back at a long past completed action. But verse 8 is in the present. He still considers the reality of Christ to be the focus of his life. He brings it up to date. Perhaps 20 hard years have passed since that transaction. But he still considers everything uh, about, is all about knowing Christ Jesus. Christ brings him satisfaction. That verse 8 is so key. Let me read it again in, 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 uh, in the Amplified Bible. Because remember, Paul is in a dungeon. He's facing death. He's in chains, awaiting execution. But listen to the passion. Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege, the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth, the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, of perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clearly. Isn't that amazing? I want to ask you, if you're a committed Christian this morning, do you still get moved by what Christ did, Jesus did to you on the cross, did for you on the cross? Are you still pressing in for more of the knowledge of Jesus? Are you still amazed as you were years ago? Are you still satisfied by Jesus? Because many of you online today have probably been around churches for a long time. We've had, we've seen everything, we've done everything, and maybe we've become cynical, we've become blasé, or we've been hurt and locked back in, or we've become apathetic. We can give all the right answers, but have we lost that overwhelming sense of debt 
to Jesus and that overwhelming desire for more? Have we slipped into spiritual mediocrity? I think Paul is trying desperately to challenge the Philippian Christians and us. Have we forgotten so quickly? Have we stopped striving for more? Have we no more spiritual ambition? Or have we slipped into middle class, middle management, middle age spiritual mediocrity or the equivalent for your life? The surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus as Lord. That is what consumed him and satisfied him. Fellow men, members of St. Mungo's, will you give yourself a spiritual audit this morning? Are you still as on fire for Jesus uh, as when you first committed yourself to him and were filled with the Spirit? Are you as on fire as you were five years ago, 15 years ago, 50 years ago? Are you living in the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus and as excited and passionate as ever you were? What do you need to relight the fire in the face of a Philippians 3 audit? How do you compare yourself to verse 8? Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Getting everything back into that perspective. Remember when Paul made his choice to become a Christian, he lost all those things and more. His reputation, his time, his financial security, his respectability, his job. And he's still living with the implications of those choices. He was still paying the price. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Wow. And I have to be a little bit careful when I translate this word rubbish because it's been cleaned up by most of our modern translations. Basically, it means, dare I say it, poo. While it can mean the kind of rubbish thrown into the street, the street refuge, the trash for the dogs to eat, it actually has a stronger meaning. It's what the dogs leave behind after they've eaten. The message says, compared to the high privilege of knowing Christ Jesus, my master, firsthand, everything I once thought I was go it was going for me is insignificant, dog dung. Good old King James had that same clear meaning and do count them but dung. It's probably not even dog dung, we're talking about human dung, human excreta, human, I won't say the word, but it begins with an S and an H, not appropriate for a 1030 service. As Gordon Fee says, the word translated rubbish is well attested as a vulgarity referring to excrement. Yes, Paul is saying that all his good deeds, all his spiritual heritage, all his good works, all those things he had spiritual confidence in, he says it's just as this, as if I am a child. He said it's just as if he was a child who just pooed on the carpet and probably said, Daddy, look what I've done. We've got to understand the intensity of how Paul saw this and, the, uh, and the, the, the damage and the danger of the false basis can be. Only when you feel ashamed, even at the best you've done, then you have to throw it all away and all you have left is Christ and his resources that are yours in order that I may gain Christ. There's that accountancy word, gain Christ. Everything is now focused on gaining Christ. Gain, that's uh, that financial term. It's about Christ. Nothing added, nothing taken away. The message translates it, I've dumped it all in the trash so I may embrace Christ and be embraced by him. Wow, what a lovely picture of what a Christian is, someone who's been embraced by Christ and uh, embrace him. That's intimacy. Now, the next verse brings us now into one of the really big concepts uh, this idea of righteousness, which it, really the whole book of Romans is about. In fact, they've, some people have called this verse a little meteorite from Romans. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Notice it's all about being in him, in Christ, united with him, intimate with him, embraced by him. Now, righteousness is not a very common word today. You won't read it in newspapers or see it on social media. But in the Christian context, it has a particular meaning. Let me quote another uh, commentator, Alec Mateer. Righteousness means being in the right with God. Paul believed that in Christ, by faith, it is possible to stand under divine scrutiny and secure the verdict. Paul 
is in the right. Paul is all that I require of him to be. Paul is righteous. But notice the righteousness that is from God. It's out from God. It is God's righteousness that he gives to us. And it comes by faith in Christ. And that faith there means putting our trust in Christ in a personal way. It's so simple. Some of you heard me before use that very simple illustration to compare these two different ways of getting right with God as do and done. Do, done. Paul discovered there was nothing he could do to be right with God because Christ had done it all. Now his righteousness, unearned and undeserved, was given as a free gift. Literally imputed, or to use a financial analogy, God put righteousness into his account. God puts righteousness, his righteousness, into your account. He's credited it into your life eternal account. And it's yours by just saying yes to his gift of love, putting your trust and saving uh, faith in Christ. Now you might think that one of the dangers of this is that you could shrug your shoulder and say, well, Jesus has done it all, I can relax and do nothing. Does this truth cut the nerve of action? Does this gift of righteousness mean lazy Christians? No, because if it's understood, it'll stir up a deep passion of gratitude. The Apostle Paul might have been a, been a Christian for 20, 30 years, but he's still got spiritual appetite. This truth stirs him up. He's still got passion. And he wants us to stay passionate no matter how long we've been around, no matter how hard it's become. And some of you are right in hardship at the moment. I know, pastorally. One translation says, my passion is to be consumed with him. Is that your passion this morning? And if not, what you're going to do about it? That leads us to our last couple of verses. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his suffering, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. He was still motivated and excited by these things. He may tell us, uh, he tells us here how to revive our passion, how to keep going. If you want to ignite your spiritual passion, then you target these areas. Maybe you found the last three months of the pandemic very hard to stay passionate as a Christian. There are passion killers out there. So what must we focus on? So how do to reignite your spiritual passion in a time of pandemic? Number one, know Christ, know him. Now, the first place where you can know Christ is through the scriptures. Know the scriptures, know Christ. It is as simple as that. Do you know, there are some surveys that sadly suggesting during COVID-19, some Christians are actually disengaging from reading the Bible and engaging with the Bible regularly. We must re-engage, but in a way that helps us know Christ personally. I read this amazing quote that stirred me up to, to, to open the Bible. Chris Webb says, the scriptures are the place where the boundary between heaven and earth has been worn through. When we open the Bible, it does not say to us, listen, God is there. Instead, the voice of the Spirit whispers through each line, look, I am here. Doesn't that, that, you, what, doesn't that make you want to get back into the Scriptures? Will you re-engage? But of course, it's more than just this head knowledge. This word know, as we know, is, is intellectual knowledge is so important. But then as we engage with Scripture, it means relationship knowledge it's a deep profound intimate the word used right through this passage means intimacy of knowing it's the intimacy of a mother with a baby a loving husband and wife it's the closest possible personal relationship to embrace and it is this intimacy is called a deeper intimacy with christ that is our first way of focus of reigniting our passion if you want to stay passionate Christian over years, it can only be done by desiring intimacy. Loss of spiritual appetite is almost always due to separation from closeness to Christ and nearly always through our own choice. How has your intimacy with Jesus been this week? Number two, the power of the resurrection. Passion needs power. Paul was power hungry, literally always desperate to know more of God's power. And here Paul is speaking of the inherent, in, inherent 
power available to us now. See, the resurrection of Jesus not only affects us in the future, but it empowers us now. Christ's resurrection released power that can enable our lives now. And it comes through the work of the Spirit. And, and when Paul talks about power, it's something he expects us to experience, not just intellectually, but experientially. Uh, the professor, Professor Gordon Fee says, we know from what Paul says elsewhere that his experience of the Spirit is the way the power of the resurrection is available for him and them. There is power of the resurrection to ignite your Christian life today. You see, if we don't have it, um, the life can sap the dynamism. It's like leaving your car lights on and the battery goes flat. But Paul hungered for more. Listen to this, how he prayed for other people in Ephesians 1, 17 and 19. I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so you may know him better and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength which he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Will you pray for that resurrection power in your life this morning? After the last song, don't rush away. Just pause, there'll be music playing on your screen. And just either on your own or with someone, just pray that the Holy Spirit will empower you with resurrection power for you to be passionate for Jesus this week. Have a ministry time for yourself and those around you. Receive more power. Yes, Lord, release it. But then he had suffering, and it is incredible. Far from being triumphalistic, um, Paul, like all of us, are aware that power and pain go hand in hand. In fact, he seems to glory in the reality of suffering. Now, this suffering here will include the suffering for the sake of Christ. The majority of Christians around the world today are probably facing persecution. It's also the suffering that we experience as Christ did. The reality of suffering because we live in a fallen world, an unfair, death-filled, pain-filled world. And we experience the suffering that he experienced from that. But there's also something here of, of some amazing way where we inter, enter into Christ's suffering as Christians. He says share in suffering. And that word share is the koinonia word. Remember we learned it right at the very beginning, chapter 1 for partnering, for fellowship. It means that we somehow partner with Christ himself. I don't understand it fully, but somehow we come into that. Power and suffering go hand in glove for the Christian. Fee says, it is through an empowering presence whereby suffering was transferred into an intimate fellowship with Christ himself. Our suffering somehow will actually get us to know Christ better. Over my life, I think I have drawn closer to Christ more in the pain than I have in the easy times. Paul wasn't going to allow his suffering to destroy his passion for Christ. In fact, he discovered it was a way to go deeper. And many of us are discovering that right now. Will you let some of the suffering you are going through help you identify with Christ and grow to know him better? Then he adds, become like him in his death. Again, there is some unity in our lives of Christ's death and our, but it's also receiving the benefits of that death. It says in Romans 6 verse 11, in the same way, count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's the cruciform life, a cross-centered life, identifying, conforming, and living for the cross, taking your cross up daily, remembering Christ's death on the cross, uniting with it, yes, even in the COVID crisis, you can stay passionate because of Christ's cross. And then number five, resurrection of the dead. Now, you could read Paul's final phrase and say, well, that's a bit odd. And so, somehow, to attain the resurrection from the dead. But is Paul suddenly worried and lacking assurance in resurrection? Of course not. It would make nonsense of everything else that he, he, that, that, that he says in Philippians. No, what it's saying is he accepts he doesn't know how and when it will happen, when the resurrection life will become his life fully and completely, the, the not yet of the kingdom. Because it could be very soon by the execution. It could be, he could be released and years later he could enter into his resurrection life when he died. 
or it could be because of the physical return of Christ. For him, the future resurrection itself is not in doubt. He just refutes the notion. What, he, what he's uncertain about is the when and the how. And as far as his concern, he said, God, that's your problem. That's your problem, Lord. That's your problem. He's still targeting the resurrection. Not just the power that empowers him now, but knowing the future hope is what keeps us passionate. The future certainty of a resurrection life motivates him. You see, the future hope will bring colour back into a life that has been dulled. You have a future hope that you should live in now. I hope these five things will keep you passionate. His passion didn't waver. Will you focus on these five things this week to help you be passionate about Christ? So let me conclude. How do we do that from the passage? The key verse, of course, is verse eight. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. This morning, I want us all to decide what our bottom line is. What is gain? What is lost? What are you counting on? Is knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, the absolute focus and I thought, how do we do it? I've, I've, I've talked a lot and give you lots of information, but, but what do I do with that information? And again, the answer comes from Professor Gordon Fee, how he ends his teaching. And I'm going to end it the same way, where he tells us what we must do. This is one of the truly surpassing moments in the Bible. It would be a tragedy if its splendor was lost in analysis. Finally, therefore, one should go back and read it again and again, until what one learns in the analysis is absorbed in praise and worship over the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ our Lord. So that's my encouragement for you this week. One should go back and read it again and again and again until what one learns in the analysis is absorbed in praise and worship over the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Before I close, I just want to pray. But I want to pray a particular prayer because obviously I have no idea who's joined us this morning for this service. Perhaps you've found us on YouTube or you've been invited or recommended by a friend to watch us. And I hope what you've heard in this talk will help you in your Christian journey. And it's possible though that you've been listening and you wouldn't at this moment call yourself a committed Christian. And I hope there's been something here that will stimulate you to do some more thinking, to be captivated by Christ and go back and read about Christ and, and talk to your Christian friends about what it means. But maybe you have been listening for a number of weeks or even just for the first time today and you're thinking through your Christian faith and you say, do you know, I want to know that surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. So I'm going to pray a prayer of commitment. I'm going to put it up, it'll be up on the screen. I'm going, to, I'm going to pray it out loud and I invite you to join me, perhaps for the very first time, to pray this prayer. You can do it quietly in your mind or you can say it out loud as a commitment prayer for you. So let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong in my life. Please forgive me. I now turn from everything that I know is wrong. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I might be forgiven and set free. Thank you you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit. I receive it now. Please come into my life by your spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time or perhaps you've been away from following Christ for a while, and you're using it as a recommitment prayer. Can you email? Can you let me know? We'll put up the, my, uh, the church email address there, or, or you can do it via the website. Just so that I know how you're responding. It will encourage me to know what's happening in your spiritual life. But particularly if you become a Christian for the first time, so I can pray for you myself and send you a copy of the little booklet where that prayer comes from. May God bless you all this week. I love you, Lord Oh, your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will
will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing. I'd encourage you that if you've, you're a guest with us and you've never given your life to Christ, then please do uh, send uh, an email to, to us and we'd love to talk to you about what it means to live for Jesus, to have Jesus on the inside and, and the life that he brings. And that email just inquires that so long as the org is going to come up. Please do email us um, and uh, let us start, help you start that journey of following Jesus. But also, that was an amazing reminder to us that Mark gave us, that, 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 that we can have the, the, the spirit uh, within us, that revelation power just within us and living, uh, living within us. And I just want us to finish by saying this glorious prayer together. 
I'm going to say it once just to let you know what that prayer is. And it's going to come up on screen and we're going to say it together. But this is the prayer. Glorious Father, I ask today that you would give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation so I may know you better and your incomparable great power for us who believe. That that power is the same as the mighty strength you exerted when you raised Christ from the dead. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. So let's, let's pray this prayer together. Glorious Father, I ask today that you would give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that I may know you better and your incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength you exerted when you raised Christ from the dead. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just pray, I want to pray God's blessing over you for the week ahead. Father, I pray that you would fill us with your love. Holy Spirit, would you help us to be obedient to your word? And Holy Spirit, would you fill us with your power so that we can live the life that you've called us to Jesus? And now may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with all of us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.